So with that, let's go ahead and move on to our keynote speaker for the morning. So um, I would like to introduce the executive producer and presenter for the television series, Computer Chronicles, Stuart Shafay. Well, thank you for inviting me to the conference. Uh, apologize if you look real closely at my face, I look like a zombie from a Michael Jackson killer video. I had an encounter with uh, an asphalt curb yesterday and the curb won and my face lost. I also broke my glasses, so I'm doing this with one eye. Good thing the presentation's not in 3D, or I'd be really lost. Okay. As I thought about this conference and meeting some of you, I realized I'm probably the guy in the room who knows the least about wireless networking. So what am I doing here? Well, I've been a journalist for 40 years covering technology, and over those 40 years, I've picked the brains of and interviewed just about everybody in this field who knows what they're talking about. I'm just a journalist. I've been doing this for 40 years. Matter of fact, I was surprised when I saw the blurb on your website for this conference in this session. It referred to me as an elder. I never thought of myself as an elder, but I guess I have to start doing that. So anyhow, not only did I interview and meet with lots of these really important people in the industry over the past 25 to 40 years, um, I've got it all on video. These are some of the really great moments, the great minds who've talked about the future of not only networking, but uh, personal technology in general. So I started doing my show, Computer Chronicles, a long time ago, back in the uh, early 80s. I started with computers back in the late 70s. Uh, my trusty Radio Shack Model 1 my 2400 baud modem, my CompuServe account, way back. It was pretty exciting that when I first logged on, I have to tell you, when I first logged on to CompuServe and saw this whole online world, it, to me it was like the first time I went scuba diving. I mean, there was this entire un infinite universe out there that I could explore. And it really woke me up to the value uh, of this whole internet and network thing. Let me tell you one story which really woke me up. I was actually in New York editing a show. It had nothing to do with the computers. And we were supposed to be done that night, and we weren't done that night, and I realized at the last minute I was going to have to spend another night in New York, and I had no hotel, no place to stay. So I looked out the window, and luckily there was a Sheraton Hotel right across the street, West 57th Street in New York. So I said, no problem, I'll go get a hotel room. So I walked across the street, said, I'd like a room for tonight. The clerk said, sorry, we're totally booked, no rooms. I said, totally booked, no rooms? What do I do now? So I walk back across the street, back to the editing studio, and I says, wait a minute, I just got this new toy called this Radio Shack 100, which has a built-in modem. And I got this new CompuServe thing that says you can do like travel stuff online. So I'm tapping away, clicking away. All of a sudden, I found the shirt on West 57th Street. I said, would you like a reservation? Yes. Here's your confirmation number. Yes. Walk back across the street, same hotel, same lobby, same guy. I said, I have a confirmation. I'd like to check in. Welcome, Mr. Chaffee. I realized the virtual world, the network world, was more valuable, more real than the so-called real world. So in doing research for this presentation, I, I really looked at a lot of old stuff. You know, as I say, we've been doing this show for a long time, several decades. Um, it was pretty fascinating to go back in time, kind of in a time machine, and see what people were talking about in the 2010s, the 2000s, the 1990s, 1980s, etc. And I really thought this would be fun to share with you guys to really see, we're trying to understand the future of networking. Well, it helps to look at the past of networking at the same time. What I discovered in my research and looking at all these interviews we had done is there are some people who are really smart but make some really dumb decisions and dumb projections about the future. There are other people who are really, really smart, and they have this magic tech crystal ball in which they can see what's coming around the corner before almost everybody else does. We're going to have some examples of both for you. So we're going to take you kind of in this time machine. I'll play sort of DJ data jockey for you, and we'll go through some of the things we've done. Let me set the scene here. We're going to actually work together on this. After all the research I did on this presentation on the history of networking, I thought, let's make a hell of a documentary for television. So we're actually working now on putting a doc together on the first 25 years of networks. And what we do normally in this process is we go back over all our video, and I looked at probably 1,000 hours worth of video from our shows, and we have to then narrow it down. It's, you know, editing a show is all about kicking out stuff, not putting in stuff. And 
I figured how, maybe I could use some help from you guys. You guys know more about this than I do. So I'm going to actually invite you into the edit room where we put together a show and show you the clips, the sound bites we're thinking of using. And hopefully you'll give me some feedback as to what you think is interesting, what you think is dumb. And you've got my email address. You've got my Twitter account. If you'd like to comment on some of the things I'm going to show you because they're sort of all over the spectrum. Keep in mind the time perspective of what we're going to be looking at. Most of what we're going to be talking about, again, back in the 80s and the 90s, was a different world then. There was no Google. There was no Facebook. No iPhone, no Amazon, no Alexa, no Netflix, no Twitter. It's hard to imagine how much the tech world has changed in just those 20, 30 years. So let me get going with a preview of what we're going to be talking about. So I broke this theoretical doc in our presentation today into six topics. Believe it or not, back in 1996, there was a vigorous debate going on about whether you should have a personal computer with a local hard drive or you should be on the network. That's an interesting discussion we'll hear about. We'll talk about network security issues, mobile, handheld, uh, introduction of broadband and Java during this period of time, who pays for all this internet infrastructure, people who make money on it, doing e-commerce and advertising. And then finally, we'll look at some people who I thought were pretty good at figuring out what the new thing was going to be. So the first section we're going to look at now, I'm calling the great PC versus NC debate. NC debate. NC stands for network computer. Some people call it a network appliance. Scott McNeely was a big advocate of this, saying you need just a simple appliance. Uh, Eckerd Pfeiffer of uh, Compaq at the time, different view altogether. You'll hear what he has to say. And then for, uh, some uh, comments from Bill Gates about PC is a network computer, just plug it in. So let me pull up this first piece of video for you. And this is Scott McNeely, very interesting, very smart guy. And let's see what he had to say about this debate. In the computer industry, we're dealing with the major buying motivations, fear and anger. <laughs> right? They're afraid you're lying about what your product really does. And then when you install it, you're angry because you were right. <laughs> Think about the difference between when you pick up your telephone if you don't have dial tone, by the time you get it to your ear, you're angry. Now think about when you turn on your PC and it actually boots. You go, yes. <laughs> you want to keep your kid off drugs, give him a Pentium Pro, an NT, and a printer. <laughs> and for six months, I guarantee the kid might not even eat. Plug and play, <laughs> right. <laughs> you can hear them. It printed! <laughs> I always ask people, how many of you have ever lost money because you had money in a bank and it got robbed or burned down or somebody stole it? I never met anybody yet who lost money in a bank. Now, any of you lost any, any data on your local disk? <laughs> a few of you have, huh? Right? Everybody loses, loses data on their local disk. What's, the, what's so weird about the concept of a data bank when you have financial banks? You can do it securely and encrypted out over the internet. I love people who are unwilling to put their information out on the net, but they'll, they'll take all that information in hard copy, unencrypted, fold it up, put it in a paper thin envelope, seal it with spit, put it in a tin box, close the door, no lock, walk away, the government comes by and picks it up for three days. <laughs> and they may be delivered to the right new tin box with no lock, no door. Boom, where anybody who can drive up, ooh, hey, there's their secret information, right? And we're all worried about this. I, you know, I, I just think that uh, it's gonna take a while for these habits to break. Think about how many times you run out of disk space on your local disk, or you drop it, or you pour a drink into your disk, or it just blows up on you or somebody kicks the power cord out. This doesn't happen in a server room run by professionals with raised floors, Halon, and all the other things you need to keep a server room up and running. That's where you want your files. That's how you want them stored. Do today's mainstream PC users really want web access without a PC? Probably not. So that remains to be seen. For one thing, much of their PC-generated work in personal business is unsuited to web browsers. How many of you really want your checking account, the stock portfolio, income tax files out on the network? 
PC is a network computer. They're connected to networks. They run browsers. And there's going to be quite a range of devices, you know, ranging down to the thing in the pocket, the intelligent TV. If the question is, you know, what, will there be machines where people just run a browser? That's all they do. Sure, uh, there will be some machines like that. But those aren't people who create word processing documents or spreadsheets or uh, who sit you know, and edit images or do preparation work. They aren't people who work on a portable basis. They aren't people who do things uh, that people who are using PCs uh, want to do today. You know, they don't run any of the Windows applications that are there. So it's fair to say there'll be a variety of devices. That if you want, if you want to buy a PC, take a, a nice PC, uh, a 486, 100 megahertz PC, they sell those for seven or $800. If you really think you can deal with not having a hard disk locally, then you can buy one for even less than that. So the, the main thing that, that's interesting is to look at what are the scenarios of usage? Will people be doing more, authoring more information? Will they be using video and audio? Do people really believe that eventually computers can be so easy to use that you can speak to them or that they, through a camera type interface, they can see things? If you're optimistic about software getting better and microprocessors getting better, today's PC is inadequate. When people look back on today, they'll say, well, this was the period where computers not only had those small screens, but the computers couldn't listen, they couldn't talk, they couldn't see, they couldn't learn. Uh, and those are things, those are the key barriers to ease of use. As long as you have to type in HTTP this dot that dot some other thing instead of just vaguely indicate a subject that you're interested in, uh, the things are not going to be that easy to use. Now, what does it take to make computers do those things? It takes software. It takes significant R&D investment in, in software. It takes a, a perseverance to get those things right. But the progress is there and the performance that will allow those things to be done in an excellent way, that is becoming available uh, through the progress of Moore's Law. This so let me stop for a second and move on to the next three years. This, by the way, was a big event that took place in Paris at an IT forum in 1996. Uh, it was a big story at the time, this, this debate about the future of computing and networks. And in fact, the headline in the Herald Tribune in Paris that morning was the Battle of the Billionaires. Ellison and Gates. Uh, so it was, it was amazing to think this seems like such a primitive argument today, but back then it was a big deal. So I want to continue now with an interesting argument from Larry Ellison, interesting comment from Jim Clark, who was running Netscape at the time, and a comment from Bob Metcalf, who knows a little bit about networks. While I talk about Bob Metcalf, by the way, I have to tell you a story he told me, especially since we are here in Tennessee right now, Al Gore country. There was a story going around in the early 1900s, uh, 1990s, that Al Gore said he had invented the internet, if you remember that. So I said, well, there's Metcalf right there. Let me ask him. I said, what do you think about this comment by Al Gore that he invented the internet? Metcalf says, he's right. I said, what? Why do you think they call it an algorithm? <laughs> yeah, that's what I did too. All right, let's continue with Larry Ellison. Is called, this age we're living in right now has been called the age of television. The age of tele is called the age of television because that's how we all get our news. At virtually everybody, virtually everybody in the, in the developed world has a television. This is how you get your news. This is how you get much of your entertainment. It is a device that can be find, found in the United States in 97% of American households. It's more popular and more common than the telephone. The telephone is in 94% of American households. PC is about 30 percent. Now, the PC industry you know, points very proudly to the fact that it's got a 30 percent penetration, and that's truly remarkable. It is remarkable. I grant you that. It's remarkable that this very complex, very expensive device is in 30 percent of American homes. But let me say it another way. 70 percent of the households in the wealthiest country in the world do not have computers. Where computers are needed most, people can't afford them and they don't understand how to use them. I'm going to argue that there will never, never be an information age. 
until we have the kind of penetration in households of computers that we have with televisions. It's called the age of television because more than 90% of us get our information from televisions. We will not have an information age until 90% of households have computers. We will never have a networked economy. We will never conduct our business uh, with 70% of American families disenfranchised and 90% of European and, and Japanese families disenfranchised. You will never have a network community. We won't educate our kids using computers. We will never, you know, we'll, we, won't, we won't be our primary form of communication, computers, until we have this 90% penetration, this notion of universal computing, universal service. Okay, now this is not a radical idea. Every network in the world works that way. Every network, every essential network in the world has a simple appliance attached to a complex, expensive network. A simple, low-cost appliance attached to a complex, expensive network. The television network is enormously complicated. It's got satellites and studios. I mean, it's tremendously complex, but the appliance whereby we access the power of the TV network, that appliance is very, very simple because we've moved the complexity out of the appliance and back, and back to the network. Same thing is true, same thing is true for the telephone network. Switches and micro, microwave relay stations, uh, huge central management systems, you know, service personnel, but the appliance, the ha telephone handset, the, the appliance whereby we tap into the power of that network, that appliance is very low cost and very simple indeed. There are other networks that are much older you know, Rome started building aqueducts you know, to pump water in so everyone didn't have to dig their own well. You know, we have electric power grids so everyone doesn't have to have their own generator. Virtually every essential network works this way. The computer network should be no different. Well, Gates and Ellison are both great people and their companies are great companies, but I think uh, um, Bill Gates has become conservative. He has, so much, he has more to lose than to gain now. And uh, Ellison, partially out of his desire to be richer than Bill Gates and partially out of his natural entrepreneurial instincts, has the, in, the more attractive position to me. I think they're both wrong. The reason is the PC isn't going to go away, but there will be other devices for accessing information. The PC won't invade every aspect of our lives. It just isn't going to happen. It's too complex a device. But the PC is a wonderful business tool. And, you know, Microsoft has done great things for the world to make PC available. To be frank, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's the greatest innovation in computing technology that's ever happened. But it's not the last thing. And there will be plenty of consumer devices, televisions, uh, uh, telephones, many different kinds of devices are going to have internet compatibility. And they won't be PCs. Uh, Microsoft's general history has been whenever someone challenges them with a new idea, they poo-poo it. Windows is the answer, go away. And then a little bit later, uh, they announce it. So Windows NC is coming. That is, Microsoft has been saying that the network computer is a dorky thing. But very soon, and in fact, we may have even heard it from Gates today, I'm not sure. They're going to announce the network computer. They'll call it something like Windows NC. It'll bear no relationship to Windows, which is overblown for this purpose. And they'll, they, then they will pretend to have invented the network computer, and that will really drive Larry crazy. <laughs> okay. It reminds me of reading a, a week-old newspaper, and everything's so funny because people were so all base, or reading a month-old news magazine. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how naive some of these discussions were at the time. Uh, let me go to the next section I want to talk to you about. And that's security. You heard Compaq's uh, Eckhart Twyfer say, will you really feel safe putting all your really important stuff online? Of course, that's kind of an old argument. Can you trust the cloud, we'd call it today? Here's three people I want you to hear from. Michael Rogers, who was with Newsweek Digital at the time, now covers tech for MSNBC. Uh, I want you to keep in mind the time frame here when these people are talking. This was the early 2000s. What happened in the early 2000s, 2001 in particular? 9-11. So there's a real sensitivity to big-time security challenges in disaster uh, environments. So Mike is going to talk about that and the vulnerabilities that the existing network infrastructure really had. We're going to hear from Michael Dell, 
who also has some interesting comments, says, well, disasters like that actually give you an opportunity to be innovative and to think of new solutions. And then we're going to hear from John Thompson, who at the time was CEO of Symantec. He's now actually chairman of Microsoft's board. And he reminds us that there was NIMDA, there was Code Red, there was some major hacks going on at the time. And he says people have learned now that you gotta, it's not enough to be reactive with security software, you've got to be proactive. So let me go back to that discussion now and move to our next slide. I think September 11 was a real testing point for the internet on a couple levels. Um, one was it continued to work when the telephone system didn't. That's how people learned that their loved ones were still alive. Um, secondly, it showed that the infrastructure is really pretty robust. I mean, it is astounding that we managed to then immediately start trading again on the stock market just one week later, and virtually nothing was lost. And that's pretty remarkable. One of the things we saw in the September 11th crisis is that while the fixed line phone systems went down and cell phone systems went down, in fact, the way that people were staying in touch was the internet. On the media side, I think what we learned it was really the first time that we had a huge media event and the internet didn't completely break. For the first few hours on the 11th, we did have some problems with people getting through to the major MSNBC, CNN sites. But by the next day, when traffic was just as high, the internet was actually working to deliver news. We've also seen that, that you know, crisis creates uh, you know, some, some, new, some, some new opportunities. And in fact, uh, the internet is playing a role in helping companies bounce back from some of these challenges more rapidly. One of our customers uh, was in one of those buildings that is unoccupiable. We've got several thousand employees and they came to us and said, hey, you know what, can, can you build us several thousand notebooks, ship those to the homes of all of our employees, literally within 24 or 48 hours so they can be at home on the internet working online. And that's exactly what we were able to do. I think what the web has facilitated is the opportunity for the graffiti writer of old to have a new forum or a new medium by which to explore. And early viruses were an example of kids playing in their bedroom. Those viruses have now become much, much more sophisticated. I think hacker attacks are at an early stage. And as more and more people learn that it is possible, more and more people will want to do it. There's actually about three or 4,000, as best we can tell, uh, public access points now for 802.11 uh, that have sprung up, whether it's in major hotel chains or coffee houses or airports, convention centers, uh, certainly a number of small businesses and, and offices. Uh, I noted one time while I was driving to our office in Round Rock in, in uh, the northern part of Austin, Texas, that I, I was able to pass through 20 different 802.11 networks. Now, of course, many of them are homes, uh, which brings up the, the issue of security, and this still, still is a technology that's being de developed in, in, a, in an embryonic sense. But it's a very exciting technology, and certainly you'd much rather have speed at, at 11 megabits than 56 kilobits or even uh, the GPRS speeds. I think customers around the world have a heightened sense of awareness of how vulnerable their network infrastructure might be and so Symantec along with everyone else in this sector of the industry is spending a lot more time talking to customers about how to assess what their vulnerabilities are and how to build a constructive plan for shoring up those vulnerabilities. What that world will bring clear to everyone is the need for a more holistic or complete security plan. You can't just assume that because I have virus detection technology on my laptop at home or on my home machine, that's enough. If you're gonna enter the broadband world or the wireless world, you ought to think about not just virus detection technology, but a personal firewall. You might wanna think about intrusion detection capability as well. And so we have moved the bar, if you will, for what individual consumers need to think about relative to security of their home devices. We know a lot about the virus detection business in our company, but in the main, it is still a reactive approach as opposed to a proactive approach. There are technologies called heuristics that allow you to anticipate based upon prior incident how another problem might occur and then 
anticipate and solve it. There is what's called behavior blocking technology that says, gee, if a file comes in that has an executable attached, that might be suspicious. It might want to execute something that's destructive on your desktop. Well, I think NIMDA and Code Red certainly change the nature of how customers think about securing their infrastructure. Uh, I think there were many market analysts who would have told you before those threats that, oh, gee, the virus market is a fairly plebeian market. It may be highly penetrated, so on and so forth. People are deploying firewalls and intrusion detection technology. What we saw with NIMDA was that it was a blended attack that entered the network through an email message. Uh, it buried a worm within that client desktop and then propagated itself out to servers that were on that network or linked to other networks. And that type of blended threat has become far more difficult to deal with and far more destructive. The code red virus cost over two billion dollars to clean up. The NIMDA virus, the results aren't in yet, but it was far more aggressive, far more pervasive, and I suspect far more expensive for companies to deal with. So new blended threats, which says firewall alone, AV alone, intrusion detection alone won't solve the problem. It's the combination of those technologies working at different tiers of the network, the best way to approach the problem. Okay, so things got a little more complicated when we got into mobile, mobile networks, obviously. Let me pull this back up here. So we're going to hear from a couple of people who really know what they're talking about. Eric Benamou, who is one of the co-founders of 3Com. Uh, he's going to make a couple of inter interesting points. People forget the thing called the Palm Pilot, which was really revolutionary at the time in making people understand that a phone could handle data, not just voice. We're going to hear from Erwin, ja Erwin Jacobs, uh, who again reminds us that the cell phone now is not just for voice, it is for data. And he adds that the other things you can add to that conversation in the mobile world or things like location services, which economically are extremely valuable. We'll hear from Michael Dell again. This is a really interesting cut from Michael Dell, in which he says, well, my company's not really interested in this handheld market. There's not a lot of money in it. I guess he should have called Steve Jobs. As we got smaller form factors for getting into the network, getting into the internet, we had an input problem if you didn't have a real keyboard. So speech recognition became very important at the time. Janet Baker is going to talk to us from Dragon Systems about how they had to try to get a, use, a workable, which took a long time, speech recognition system to allow people to talk to their computers, something we kind of take for granted now. And then we'll hear from Gates again, who was very big on speech recognition. And again, remember, all this discussion was taking place before there was Siri, before there was Alexa, before there was Google Assistant, et cetera. So let's go back to our videos and talk about mobile. And this is what we're really gearing Palm OS to do beginning this year. So most of the new Palms will have wireless. Many new Palms will have voice capability. Palm OS will have capabilities to handle multimedia and wireless. Um, and, and in general, um, this, this sort of uh, compelling use, I think, ensures a very, very uh, bright future for this, this part of the business. Clearly. Voice has been the major business for mobile telephony to date, and probably will be the major source of revenue for the next few years going forward. But data is becoming increasingly important. And once you begin to have the ability to access, well, your stock prices, uh, to get uh, information about restaurants, to get some websites that may be favorites, to have your personal information updated while you're on the move, it becomes very habit forming. You really like to have that. And so whereas we'll probably for the next few years still use our telephones mostly for voice communications, the internet capability will become increasingly important. What we realize is by properly optimizing the radio links for internet data, that we could get very high data rates even in the one and a quarter megahertz bandwidth. We don't have to go to wider bandwidths and there's a lot of cost savings if you don't have to do that and a great deal more flexibility. And so, although originally we thought you had to go to five megahertz, and most other people are pursuing wider bandwidth, we demonstrated that you get these very high data rates in the one and a quarter megahertz bandwidth. 
and so it makes it very economic. We're going beyond that. We're actually, with the new chips that we put in our telephones and provide to many manufacturers, providing a second very powerful computer on the same chip. And so you can put any operating system in. And so today we think about uh, simple operating systems, the Windows CE, the Palm, Symbian. I think you're going to have the most powerful operating system sitting in your telephone in the future, always communicating with the net and bringing whatever information and applications you, uh, that you might need. First of all, there's the emergency use. If there's an emergency, you want to be able to pinpoint exactly where that phone is. GPS enhanced as we do it with the phone allows that to occur. And then there's a whole set of applications that will take advantage of knowing position information. And so we think it's going to open up a whole set of other businesses. Well, the one I mentioned at my talk was a chat room type where uh, uh, you, you provide a capability that you walk into the shopping center, it identifies which of your friends are in the area, allows you to communicate and perhaps meet up with them if you wish. There was an interesting study recently that uh, A.T. Kearney conducted, and they asked people, you know, uh, what, how many of you would like to use your cell phone to spend money online? And only 4% said yes. Now, uh, it's, it's quite conceivable that, that this small screen would be your only window to the internet, but I doubt it. <laughs> That's an idea, actually, that was pretty popular a year or two ago. People were talking about, oh, yeah, we're gonna, no, no, not going to have computers anymore. We're all going to have these little tiny screens. That's going to be our window to the internet. Even with GPRS, which is sort of a... Uh, sort of a WAP plus kind of environment as I've experienced it traveling across Europe. I don't think that uh, the mobile devices are going to completely replace uh, notebook computers. As far as the handheld market goes, you know, it's not nearly as great a priority for us today as storage or services uh, or, or other potential markets. And, you know, it's, it's, the reason for that is it's really not a very big market and it's not a very profitable market. So you know, we, we like markets that are big and profitable and where we know our business model will work. We think the business model would work in handhelds, but we, we just don't see the size yet. We do not look at having speech as being the, the means by which you throw away keyboards. I think that that's kind of silly. Um, we see that speech is an important um, complementary tool to add to your mouse, your keyboard, your digitizing tablet, whatever else you have. And Dragon makes it especially easy to move between whatever different input modalities you have, and also the output modalities. Um, but as we see the form factor shrink with uh, you know, smaller devices, which are becoming ever more prevalent and more popular, um, the keyboards are too small to use. And we sometimes say that you don't want to enter text by toothpick. Um, indeed, the only way that you're ever going to get a great deal of data into a small device is by talking. Speech recognition software is far better today than it was three or four years ago. But unfortunately, this is a very interesting market where once you cross over a threshold of reliability where people are very comfortable with it, then you'll have a very large size market. But as long as you're just approaching that threshold, the total market is extremely small. It's a very specialized market that's, say, you know, a ten thousandth of the general market. And so everybody dreams of that general market, but until you get to that magic point where it's, it's extremely reliable, you don't really have something that's, that's ready for prime time. We've really just scratched the surface with what we're doing for knowledge workers today. Uh, one of the, the big step advances will be when we get the elements to come together, wireless networking, uh, tablet type computers, where you literally can carry around a device that's satisfactory for reading, satisfactory for note taking. Uh, that kind of advance means that you won't have this big divide between your paper based information and your digital information. And that's been a bit of a holy grail. People have talked about it for a long time. It's taken a decade of, of work on the software pieces and the hardware pieces, whether it's the batteries or the networks, to now say that the critical mass is there to really drive a whole new wave of expectation of what you get out of these personal productivity devices. Now Larry Ellison had for many years talked about the network appliance and he envisioned a computer that didn't have a hard disk perhaps, was stripped down but always connected to the net. That indeed is the telephone. And so the thing he missed was that it's already coming to us as a telephone. That will be indeed that wireless, that, that uh, network appliance. I guess he was right.
Let's go to our next subject here. And talk about broadband in Java. There were two really important things that happened during this 25-year period. We're going to hear from Eric Benamou, uh, founder of 3Com. He makes two really interesting points. We assume today that broadband was easy to launch. In fact, it was very problematic when we tried to sell broadband to consumers. He makes another really interesting point about what really drove broadband subscriptions. It was an illegal website called Napster. When Napster came out, everybody wanted that free music. They were going to pay for broadband coverage. We're going to hear from a guy named Joel Dreyfus, who has worked as a tech reporter for just about every major publication. He gives us the chicken and egg argument. You buy the hardware while you wait for the software. Do you buy the software and wait for the hardware? Uh, then we're going to turn to Java and hear from Ed Zander, who was president of Sun at the time. He makes a really interesting point that Java was act probably the first example of something going viral before we talked about going viral. They didn't spend any money promoting Java. They didn't advertise it. It just sort of happened. And people said, this is a pretty cool tool. And I'll go for it. And then we're going to hear from Esther Dyson, who published the uh, newsletter, very respected newsletter, uh, Release 1.0. And she talks about... Java really brought the use of agents that people had talked about that never really had worked very well before. And she points out the additional security problems that come when you allow Java into your computer because who knows what that software is really going to do. So let's go to talk about broadband and Java, and we'll move to our next video. Which is here. No, I'm sorry, I went one too far. Why did I get lost here? Hold on. Sorry? Uh, all right, let me go on to the next one, and then we'll come back to that. As everyone is going to have a cell phone on the planet, um, you know, or, or close to it, once we get satellite delivery and you know the, the access on the on the uh, um, server side. So, in terms of pure number, raw number of endpoints, yes, but it'll also be you know common everyday appliances. Again, this intelligence is being embedded in in everything we use in our in our lives, and it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to do that. And and what happens then is there's a service capability, a revenue stream that the provider of that you know, a dashboard system in your car or, you know, consumer appliance can now start charging for uh, subscription fees. That will become part of the standard revenue model instead of just, you know, one time charge for, you know, the device itself and then that's the end of the road. One of the Stop for a second. Two things that Kim uh, points out here, which are very interesting. She was the first one to talk about a subscription revenue model on the net. You don't just sell something once and get your price and get your money for it, but you get people on somebody's credit card month after month after month, and that's how you can make money on these subscription services. Uh, she also talks about, she was the first one I heard talk about IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, which is pretty interesting. We're going to hear after uh, Kim, Jim Clark, who was the first one to really see Netscape, I'm, I'm sorry, Netscape, I mean Netflix, she said, hey, I mean, uh, Jim Clark said, the PC is going to become your television set. Was he ever right? We're going to hear from Earl Peeper, who was with uh, Tandem Computers at the time and then also working for Philips. He, has a, he calls AI not artificial intelligence, but ambient intelligence, where there are smarts embedded in devices, so that it could be in your clothing. Really interesting stuff. We'll hear from Esther Dyson again, who says, the network, the internet was really subversive in that it changed the power relationship between little guys and big guys. And she, of course, was foreseeing things like Twitter and social media. We'll hear from Steve Jurvetson, one of the smarter guys I've ever met, a venture capitalist from Draper, Draper Fisher Jurvetson, who explains why VCs are happy to lose money. You've got to listen to this one. And finally, from Mitchell Kurtzman, who started three different high-tech companies in the Silicon Valley, and talks about the way the funding model, the funding formula for startups has really changed uh, over the years. So let's go back to this video, and then I'll pull up the other ones in a minute. Applications available on computers will be television. Television will become an application as opposed to a standalone technology. And one of the applications may simply be treat it like cable. You may just say, uh, 
I want, I want my, my television, cable TV, and then you'll be able to use a remote just like you use television today. Or you may say, I want to watch uh, you know, uh, some favorite movie. And, uh, or you may say, I want to watch the, uh, the news in Paris on channel, you know, the, your favorite TV channel in, in Paris and uh, get local real-time, I mean, real-time feeds of that news on a completely open switch basis throughout the world. This is what's coming over the next five to 10 years. And that's why I think the internet is such an important phenomenon. It's about this notion of, of built-in but, but transient. Ambient is like built-in but transient uh, intelligence of the consumer so that the device does know what that consumer likes to do, how they like to do it, where they like to do it, how often they like to do it. Sounds like a, you know, another story. But uh, I really feel that it is much more up to these intelligent devices of the future to make life of the consumer easier. Let's not ask the consumer to learn all these new things. That would be dumb. We did produce these buttons that uh, would, it comes out of a larger concept, which is about uh, you know, how to use clothing or, or you know, electronics very close to the person that, that would be able to inform others about who you are, uh, what you like, etc. And so one of the ways that, to do that was to to have an electronic signal actually represent you in a forum. And as soon as two, quote, compatibility signals would, would see each other, that would be communicated through a button lighting up. And you know, it, it apparently was a big hit in the discos where people who had never met before would probably never meet. But now by just you know, mingling, suddenly lights went on. And they said, ah, that must be OK. <laughs> checks your email to see if it has any strong words or vocabulary that you might want to think a second time before you actually send that email. So it, 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 it checks it, has an algorithm and vocabulary to see whether that's something you might want to think about twice. It may be a little bit playful at the present time, although people get a chuckle from it, but uh, it could be end up being a useful capability. It certainly has gotten a lot of attention. Major that was something he's referring to called Mood Watcher, which, believe it or not, Qualcomm came up with at the time. So if you write an email and it has things you might not really want to send, it gives you a chance to stop it and unsend it. At the time, that was a big deal. Changes that people will stop talking about the Internet because it will become so much a part of our lives, like, you know, plugging into a wall socket uh, or turning on a water faucet. It'll just become, you know, as John Doerr calls it, the Evernet. It's always on. It's always there. Everything's connected. There's software and intelligence in every everyday object that we use. And we'll just assume that the Internet is part of the, the basic sort of plumbing of our lives that surrounds us. We'll stop talking about it and we'll stop thinking about it. And that's when I think we'll know we've succeeded. In the short run, it will disappoint people. In the long run, it will change things far more than anybody knows. The, the basic thing that the net does is it's profoundly subversive because it changes the balance of power. It used to be information would go out this way and the little guy was even less significant than a hundred little guys didn't have the power of one big guy. But now each little guy has his own He's the center of his own universe and can reach out to whomever he wants. So it, it's unsettling for governments, it's unsettling for large corporations, it's unsettling for all kinds of hierarchies. When I took uh, PowerSoft public in 93, the rule was that you couldn't go public unless you had minimum three, better four consecutive quarters of growing profitability. Uh, today, of course, uh, profitability is never mentioned almost in IPOs. It's always off in the future. Uh, today, clearly, uh, what people are buying in IPOs is they're buying promises of the future. And effectively, uh, the comment I mentioned that Bill Gurley, uh, one of the more brilliant guys in our industry, made is that what changed is that internet companies are valued today not on how much money they make, but on how much they spend under the theory that the companies that spend the most have the best chance of getting market share, which maybe someday will turn into revenues and profits. I think there should be more crazy businesses funded that fail, given the returns we're seeing for the ones that do well. I mean, you think about it. If you were an investor in eBay or in Hotmail or in GoTo or in Tumbleweed or in Net Zero in our portfolio, if we could have doubled the number of losers but captured one more winner, we would have done it. I mean, let me say that again. If we could double our losers to gain one more winner, that would be a good trade-off. Because you can only lose 100% of your money. 
But when you hit it big, we've made a thousand times our money on some of the ones we've hit big. Names are important. People are, 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 if you look at who's successful today, particularly in the stock market. So we've been thinking, how do you get Sybase more successful? So clearly you could go Sybase.com. That's one option, but that may be too common. Uh, the, the small letter I is becoming very important now. For instance, look what Apple has done with the iMac. So we think maybe iBase would be a, a good idea. But my favorite is, uh, if you look at perhaps the most successful company in the, in the internet space today, I think we, we should change the name to Wazoo and make our marketing slogan, Up Your Wazoo. I think it's a winner. All right, I messed that up. So let me call up the two things that we lost here because I can't see. Here we go. So this is the section on broadband and Java that I wanted to play last time. I think initially there were much more significant growth pains than we expected. The logistical issues associated with uh, the delivery of broadband was vastly underestimated. The number of truck rolls required to install broadband uh, made the whole business uh, very difficult from a financial returns perspective. The revenue per, su per subscriber has probably not lived up to expectations, in part because the service didn't deserve it. So the service was kind of a lousy service, not a lot of value-added services, no compelling applications. I've always thought it was a little archaic that the web, which was touted as this great new revolution, was all the printed word, for the most part. We're now getting to music, we're now getting to video. I think the big obstacle to broadband is price. People may pay willing to pay 10 bucks more for broadband, but do they want to pay 39.95 or 49.95 for it? At least now, when the when the value add isn't there, when there aren't just these great applications that you can use, people are not willing to pay that much more. Bandwidth helps uh, hide a lot of sins, but at some point you cannot just throw bandwidth at all the problems. It becomes just too expensive. You also have to be more intelligent about how you use networks. A good analogy is, in fact, if you think about your telephone, uh, your telephone service, most people who subscribe to a telephone service have to select a plan that uh, the telephone service providers offers. Your choice of a, of a plan is actually used by the telephone company to essentially figure out what your usage patterns are and to, to manage their own telephone network more intelligently, to inject the bandwidth where they need to, and to, and, and to move bandwidth around the network at different times of the day. That concept is, is commonplace in telephone networks. It has not been used in data networks. But it turns out the, the, the distribution, dissemination of uh, audio content like Napster did was extremely popular and accounted for a growing percentage of broadband traffic. And, and all of the broadband carriers which I have spoken to have confirmed that as Napster basically was, was hit by, <coughs> by, by these judgments, there was a drop in broadband traffic. So we, we could clearly see that, uh, that rich content, whether it's audio or, or, or video, accounts for uh, a good bit of the, the benefits associated with broadband. We had no announcement, no $200 million ad budget, no rock songs, no movie stars, and yet We've been just overwhelmed with the interest level and the number of companies. We, we probably have several hundred companies today already javatizing their applications. Uh, ESPN with Starwave is, 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 is javatizing their homepage. Uh, we have uh, local newspapers that are beginning to use it. Uh, we're seeing other um, private companies, uh, uh, not public companies, I mean, sorry, public corporations beginning to use it for their own internal application development. Uh, the source code is available, and you can actually get the Java, hot Java browser over the network live. So we're not even sure of the amount of companies that are using it, because since we've been giving away the browser for free. The future model is I sit, at, I buy my desk that I need, whether it's a Unix desk, a Mac desk, or a, or a Windows desk, and I get my applications over the network. And I, and I basically go to the network and load in my word processor, load in my spreadsheet, or whatever I want, 
for whatever I need, I use it, and then I basically discard it, and when I need it, I go get it again. It, it's basically application on demand over the network as opposed to application uh, designed to the operating system. Two guys in a garage somewhere in South Dakota today writing a word processor and publishing to that network a Javatized word processor, and anyone on any machine, if their browser is, an, is Javatized, which Netscape is going to do, and they'll talk about that uh, here tomorrow, um, can have access to that word processor. A fundamentally different way in looking at application development and deployment. Very significant. It's this whole, it's what everybody talks about. It is genuinely, instead of simply getting content off the net, you get capability off the net. You have if, agents. I mean, this is what it is. It's just the word agent has gotten overhyped, and now, now it really exists. It's Java. The Java apps are restricted, so they can't really mess around with your machine because it's kind of like, call it safe sex. I mean, you get real movement, but it's still got a kind of membrane around it that protects your fundamental machine from the thing doing too much. All right. <laughs> Good old Esther. Uh, let me just call out the other one which we missed before. All right, lastly, we're going to turn to the revenue side. We've been figuring out how people can spend money on networking. Everybody asks, well, how are you going to make money with all this investment you're making and all this network infrastructure? And this is what these guys answer to in this section. And we just have enough time for this. There's Mike Rogers again, who, believe it or not, there was a discussion at the time of the Internet. How do you make money on the Internet? Is it a big gamble? We're going to hear from Candace Carpenter, who ran an e-commerce site called iVillage, and she makes the point which... Most people weren't willing to make it. Not everything really works on e-commerce. We hear from a guy named Jeff Brewer, Brewer who started a site called GoTo.com. It's not the same as the GoTo.com today. He was ahead of his time before Google Ads. He had the idea of charge people to end up high in the rankings in the e-commerce search engine. Everybody thought that was a horrible idea, but the fact is that's what Google does. We hear from Dan Gilmore, who was a tech reporter covering Silicon Valley for San Jose Mercury News. He says, it's terrible. The internet has simply become a market for gathering eyeballs, and that's not what it was meant to be. He said, it's not a good business model. We hear from Steve Jurvetson again, who says, what's wrong with that? The, the internet e-commerce is simply the digital version of the yellow pages. You buy bigger ads, you pay more money on the yellow pages. We're going to hear from Tim Google, who was running Yahoo at the time, uh, who says, the reason internet advertising was so big is because it was better than broadcast or print because you got real-time metrics, you got real-time feedback, you knew what people were doing with your ad. We hear from a guy named David Weatherill, who was running a company called CMGI, and he said it on the bottom line, this is all about capturing eyeballs and finding ways to monetize that. Finally, a very smart guy, Ray, Ar Ray Lane, who was the president of Oracle for a while, who used this term click loyalty, which I find very interesting. He talks about how in the internet, in the online world, it's very easy to be disloyal. So let's play this clip. I think people who have been out trying business models on the net are beginning to think that there may not be a single solution, which is, is not surprising, but that in fact it may require a number of revenue streams to keep a website going. Uh, because any one of them is, is quite thin. If you look, for example, at advertising, um, the total amount of money spent on advertising on the web last year, 1995, was equal to the amount of money spent in the United States on signs on top of taxi cabs. And it's actually not going to increase a whole lot. Perhaps by the turn of the century, it could be as large or larger than the amount spent on radio. But even that does not support an industry anywhere near as big as the one we're starting to scale up. So advertising is not a solution. Transactions are not by themselves a solution. It may turn out it's a mix. I believe that there's a kind of shopping that belongs in stores. You know, Versace gowns should be, a, should be an in-person experience. 
But I think buying your fourth pair of Gap jeans in the same size and color, I, why would you want to go take that time out of your life? Why wouldn't you want to go to a, something that had all that recorded and you just push a button? So what I think is the shopping experience will begin to really bifurcate into things which are truly pleasurable shopping experiences and then the internet will replace those things which are mostly annoying shopping experiences for people because they're repetitive and, and exhausting and all of us have had those shopping experiences. The internet will replace those completely, I'm sure. We're aligned in interest with both the consumers and the advertiser, with the buyer and seller because we make money when consumers find what they're looking for and when an advertiser gets a high quality targeted lead, it's likely to develop into a customer relationship. So take a search term like fly fishing. Um, fly fishing, a term that's searched on thousands of times a month, a really great you know, vertical, very interested uh, 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 parties that are um, doing that search. We have 25 advertisers who have said, I want to be there when somebody types in fly fishing. And here's what I'm willing to pay for a click through, a customer acquisition opportunity. We order those results by how much they're willing to pay. Go to is quite frankly about who pays the most to get the eyeballs. And uh, if it works, more power to them. But I don't think it will be the, uh, the end all of these kinds of things because it, some people can obviously afford to pay more and it doesn't necessarily make them the most relevant. When you search for something on almost any website, you get a million results, completely useless, reams and reams of data. And the first few results are gibberish. If you go to goto.com, just give it a try. Search for anything you're looking to buy. Look for any information you're looking for. And I, and, I, and I promise you, you'll find results in the top 10 listings that are much better than any other site. What's more is GoTo, in fact, wants you to get to what you're looking for as quickly as possible. If you go to GoTo and you search for something, they are delighted if the first click you make gets you where you want to go and you'll never come back. They make money doing that. Yahoo makes money by serving page view after page view. So they give you 10 result listings at a time. If it's not in the first 10, you push a button, next 10, push a button, next 10. Go to gives you a huge list of listings, look at them all, find where you want to go, get out of there, get the, where you're going. It's a direct marketing paradigm that's enabled on this medium. All media in the past have been one way. T this is Tim Kugel of Yahoo, by the way. You never really knew directly whether somebody saw the ad and whether they got excited about it. Same is true for print, same is true for cable, same is true for radio. You can measure it here, real time. And for that reason, um, advertisers who are coming up the learning curve say, look, I can measure this and I can see, in fact, how it's performing and I can change it. And they're beginning to tie some of the compensation schemes with their agencies to actually creating performance. Try to start by capturing as many eyeballs as possible uh, with com through companies like uh, Lycos and Alta Vista, which are reaching a large percentage of the web. And then uh, with another company, uh, engage technologies, collecting the click streams that people make across thousands of websites to create aggregate interest profiles so that we can better target people's interests uh, when, we, when we do get those eyeballs coming through our sites and, and sites of our customers. If you're successful in targeting those eyeballs, hopefully you can uh, make more revenue from advertising, sponsorships, e-commerce, uh, which are also going to feed into uh, product fulfillment where we have a fulfillment company. I'm a loyal customer of you. Okay, you're, you're my supplier. I've done business with you for 20 years. Well, I feel like I'm actually violating our relationship if I actually go talk, sit down, talk to one of your competitors. I'm gonna do it, I probably will check the prices, but you've made it difficult for me because we have a relationship or because you have a physical uh, connection that allows me to do that. On the internet, all I have to do in the privacy of my office without you ever knowing it is click to your competitive web website look at the prices, look at availability, and even try it. First time my wife went to Amazon, she didn't trust it. She said, you know, this is, but we'll try it. S ordered six books, five showed up. She says, aha, I, I, doesn't work. I'm going back to the bookstore. Amazon gave her the, the last book, didn't give it to her for free, but sent it to her and basically made it such a high quality experience that she said, there's no reason not to, not to, to do it this way and a lot of products will be bought that way. And so her loyalty you know, was, was easier to change. It was click loyalty as opposed to having to get into a car or drive or meet somebody new or fill out paperwork, none of that. All she had to do was click to a website and she was disloyal. All right, that's a bunch of stuff we're thinking of putting in this doc. Let me uh, go back to our PowerPoint here.
And I, I found this stuff fascinating, maybe because I'm an, an, el an elder. <laughs> but the history of all this stuff and how it happened and the mistakes that were made, I think, is pretty damn interesting. I hope you found some of this interesting, too. Thank you for your time and attention. Much appreciated.